just whatever they want with it, uh, with that money, which is not the intent of the law. So you have to have strong, let's say, contracts, covenants, uh, and you have to have requirements for collateral to ensure that the purpose for which the uh, you know any uh, borrower borrowed money is uh, aligned with the initial mandate for which the loan was given. Now, from now on, we will describe something called the external finance premium, which is also called the cost of capital. Cost of capital is the rate at which you can borrow in the market, right? This is the cost that a bank charges for being in business. So there is something called, I mean, the, these are not described in the uh, uh, PPT. There is something called risk-free rate, which is the rate at which the government lends money. Uh, you can uh, buy a government of India bond or uh, US treasury bond. That is called the risk-free rate because we call it the risk-free rate because we assume that the governments or sovereign governments don't default. So let's suppose the risk-free rate is 5% and uh, banks charge 4% on top of 5%. So the uh, overall interest rate for a retail bank is 9%, 5 plus 4. So this is also called cost of capital, also called external finance premium. Now, external finance premium, when uh, you're, uh, you're in the, pro uh, whenever there is stress in the market or whenever there is recession, these external uh, finance premiums go up or cost of capital goes up. Now, we, we will understand as to why that is the case. So when I say cost of capital or external finance premium, I'm talking about the average external finance premium across the economy. I'm not talking about an interest, an anecdotal case of one person lending to another and charging 13%. I'm talking about the average in the entire economy. Banks also borrow from ultimate savers. So when I say ultimate sa savers, I'm talking about uh, you know, uh, retail as well as other instruments that exist out there. Banks lend from lend and borrow from each other. It can be deposits, uninsured, commercial paper, re repurchase agreements. We can get into it if anybody has any doubt on any of these. So, however, reliance on the main issue with banking or the risk of banking, so to speak, is whenever there is a short-term uh, liability, which is used to fund a long-term loan. Now, what happens as a result is liabilities or deposits are demand deposits. You, you, let's suppose a person A goes to the bank and deposits uh, a lakh rupees. Now, he can go and the bank might think he might, uh, there are possibilities wherein he can leave the lakh, for, lakh rupees for the next one year, or he can you know, go uh, the next very day and take 50% of that back. You don't know the 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 uh, the cushion that the bank has as to how long it can hold that amount to lend that out to a, a worthy firm which can use that for plant property and equipment. The problem with loans being long term is because most of the loans are collateral. Let's suppose a majority of the percentage of the loans are collateral loans. Uh, that means uh, let's suppose you're building a new college building. It takes uh, two years to build a college building. And let's suppose some bank lends you money. And in bit, after six months, if the bank says uh, they want the money back, then there will be panic, right? So this is exactly what I'm talking about. Because that loan that the bank gives out is backed by short-term liabilities, which are deposits of retail customers, which can pull out that money at any given point in time. And the fact that banks manage all this is the function of the bank. Now, uh, we want to understand when, when the, the, the cases when there are no problems is when the net worth of borrowers and the uh, lender's net worth is very high. Like if the person who's borrowing is, you know, uh, whose net worth is very high, that means he has enough cushion. Let's suppose the project that he's executing doesn't go as planned he can still use the remainder of the savings that he has to repay that loan. So is the case with lender. Lender makes, let's say, 100 loans and lets uh, two or three loans default. He still has the cushion of 97 other loans or 98 other loans to rely on to get back his capital. The key insight is, from all this, is that whenever you have external finance premium going high because of stress in the economy, interest rates go high, which is the case right now, as you can see, the interest rates in US and interest rates in India are going high. The credit 
the amount of aggregate credit falls. As a result, the economic output falls because you cannot, let's suppose you're building a plant and you're able to uh, borrow at 9% and the interest rates go up to, let's say, 10% or 11%, the expansion that you had previously envisioned wouldn't be the same rate. You have to cut down on it because the interest rates are high. So this creates negative shock. This decreases the net worth of companies. So just as a thumb rule, every, uh, let's say, one ba 100 basis point increase in interest rate, the net worth of, uh, let's say, companies decreases by 10%. So it's like a thumb rule. It's not always true, but if you could check uh, if the risk-free rate is zero percent, and if it and you borrowed, and the net worth of a company like let's call it Byju's is twenty billion, and uh, the interest rates go up by one percent, one percent as in hundred basis points, uh, you can imagine almost uh, the net worth of a company like Byju's dropping by two billion. Rough calculation. Don't hold me to it. The average uh, uh, external finance premium both affects uh, both affects and is affected by the state of the economy. So this, as you can see, which was stated in the previous thing, the external finance premium affects the economy because it contracts the economy because the fact that economy is contracting ensures that it further increases external finance premium. So the interest rates affect the economy, economy affects the interest rates back. It's a circular relationship. That is what is being told here. So as you can see, uh, somebody uh, by the name Gilchrist and Zach Rizak, uh did a time series analysis from the 1970s. This graph tells you the corporate bond rates to uh, risk-free rate ratio. So uh, corporate bond rate is, it's supposed if it is 2% on y-axis, that means the differential between corporate bond rates to risk-free rate is 2%. So corporate bond rate would be six and risk-free rate is four. So that's what it means at 2%. Now, as you can see, as and when the rates go higher, the recession happens. Not most, uh, not all the time, but most of the time. As you can see in 2007 and nine, uh, the external finance premiums went really high that meant that credit markets completely froze. There was no lending activity at all. So that is what leads to panic in the markets and everybody kind of stops transacting because everybody goes to safety. Now this needs, this is the lesson from the Great Depression that Benanti sort of found out that panic of recession is more dangerous than the recession itself, which because, you know, there, there is an element of game theory in one that I'll probably explain at an opportune time, wherein the fact that you react thinking somebody else will react ensures that on an aggregate, more people react. I mean, we can get into the details if uh, anybody has questions on this. And uh, I mean, we talk about, uh, I'll just run through these slides quickly. I mean, if you have uh, further questions on depression, I can get back to you. One of the major causes, and there were a couple of causes, but one of the major causes of Great Depression in the 1930s was the, the linking with gold standards. The exchange rates were linked with gold standards. And as you can see in the line below, the countries which left gold standard earlier were able to recover much faster than the countries which held on to the gold standard from the 20s and 30s onwards. Now, Dananke wanted to understand what is the mechanism as which ensured that this recovery was slow. What, what was the mechanism here? He was investigating this. And he wrote a couple of papers on this, wherein he came to the conclusion that uh, whenever credit markets freeze, that ensures, whenever credit markets freeze or the banking um, uh, you know, sector as a overall has enormous stress, then economy sort of contracts. And I think he gives description as to the number of uh, banks that disappeared in the 1930s. And uh, because there were uh, too many risky loans and there were no willing borrowers and all the banks were having NPAs, non-performing assets. So the, this issue was not solved for almost 10 years. And as he goes into the details as to 
the number of uh, delinquency rates was in between 20 to 60 percent, which is very high. I mean, usual delinquent uh, delinquency rates, uh, essentially, it's, these are default rates of loans are under 10 percent. So 20 to 60 percent is chaotic, right? And also at this rate, usually uh, there is deflation, uh, which I mean is explained in the last but one line here, uh, wherein like let's suppose you're a, a industrialist and you're building a plant and uh, you have to and in, you're producing a product uh, which costs about a lakh rupees and if the price of that uh, and it takes a it takes about a year to manufacture that product and when you do manufacture the product the price has dropped to let's say 70 rupees then you will incur a lot of uh, uh, losses right so extreme uh, inflationary uh, environment can cause uh, loss of confidence in the market, leading to deflationary environment. Deflationary environment meaning the prices just drop across the board, so nobody can make money, which is a very dangerous scenario. And he understood the way to stop that is to, uh, let's say, let's stop the, he wanted to stop the cardiac arrest of the banking system. Which, which is essentially allowing the credit to flow again. So uh, he, he, he uses that, and he was the Federal Reserve Chairman at that point in 2007 and 2009. He used this knowledge to sort of uh, solve that problem by uh, giving out lots of uh, loans and allowing the banks to start lending again, as, because as I showed you in the graph, the uh, the corporate bond rate had spiked enormously to a point it froze the credit markets. That will just, um, which essentially leads to a lot of fire sale. Whenever there is fire sale, uh, uh, in the price at which uh, price, uh, the, whenever there is uh, you know, fire sale, the bid and ask spread, as somebody would put it, uh, would be enormously high. So whenever there is enormous difference between price and value then uh, uh, it's also an opportunity as well as uh, uh, a dangerous situation. Now, this is what is being described here. Uh, so during uh, stressful times, uh, both borrowers and lenders come under great amount of stress. And the way to solve this problem is to ensure that the banking system starts lending again. And uh, there is no issue in terms of bank adjudicating what the risk rate is to their borrower and to do this uh, you have to do certain things to ensure that the risk is sort of contained and uh, the I, as uh, it's uh, I, you know what he concluded was the finan financial panic was the primary cause of great recession the great recession is the period between 2007 to 2009 so the, the fact that people are panicked about the fact that other people are pulling out money is the reason you pull out money. So there is some game theoretical uh, uh, you know, in insight from this, which we will get to in a minute. So, so this is a great uh, graph, which probably, so the, the delinquency indicators is the red graph, uh, which essentially tells you the amount of uh, defaults on loans. The black line is the actual real GDP, which is going down. But if you see the panic indicators, which is the amount of uh, confidence that people have in the state of affairs in the market, these panic indicators are a better, indi uh, let's say, predictor of recession. So as you can see, uh, the black line follows the blue line almost, almost uh, uh, everywhere. So I think you have to understand that panic in the market is a very dangerous thing. So you have the, the primary responsibility of the sovereign government as well as the central bank is to ensure there is no panic. So I've you know, contained all this in uh, one slide. So uh, the repeating again, uh, this, uh, the, the new insight that uh, Bernanke has come up with in the last 15 years is that sometimes these negative shock increases interest rates, which is increase in EFP, which also decreases the amount of credit available to firms, which makes banks conservative, which also decreases the net worth, which is what is happening, which is what is happening right now, precisely in 2022. 
So positive cycle, which is let's say cycle from 2009 to 2020, uh, because of the fact that it's a, you're trying to recover, there is some sense of positive shock. That also means the interest rates stayed low, which was the case from 2009 to 2020, which ensures that there is extraordinary credit availability at very low rates, which also ensures that banks lend aggressively, which incre increases the net worth of all assets. So you can imagine from 2009 to 2009 to 2020, all asset prices had inflated almost two to three times the actual value. And he explains this uh, uh, in, in a concept called financial accelerator that he essentially pointed out. This is, this is what is getting amplified. And the reason it is getting amplified is due to this phenomenon called Nash equilibrium. Uh, there are two equilibriums in general in economics, uh, comparative equilibrium, wherein uh, the supply and demand match, and there is an actual transaction, and the market clears that commodity or some solution that somebody is trying to sell somebody else. That is comparative equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium is uh, the, the, the ways an agent behaves given uh, and the, the way agent behaves in an optimal manner for himself, given the fact that other people are expected to behave in some rational way. And this is applicable to bank runs because, you know, other people think they'll be uh, bank, uh, you know, uh, banks are going bankrupt. They all try to pull money at the same time uh, and no bank can sustain that. I think uh, we're running out of time. So I'll just uh, quickly run through some of the other concepts. As I previously told you, there is a, a notion of equilibrium here. Uh, you know, the price at which supply and demand is equal is comparative equilibrium and Nash equilibrium is essentially a choice for which an agent is optimal given the choices of other agents. So, I mean, this is the model for which these people won the prize, which was a paper that they wrote in 83, uh, which is called uh, Douglas Digbig uh, model. I'll just get into the basics of it and explain the broad layout. Uh, good equilibrium is uh, people try, try to withdraw money only when there is uh, only when there is a genuine necessity. Bad equilibrium is they withdraw money because they are panicked and they fear other people will withdraw money and they'll lose all their money. Like FTX, for example, it's a fire sale. And the it, reason it's a fire sale is a lot of people pulled out money because everybody else thought they, you know, the, this company will go bankrupt. That's a bad equilibrium. Now, there are some, uh, pro there was one proposal wherein, uh, uh, so in the entire banking system works on fractional reserve uh, way, wherein uh, you don't lend out all the money, you keep some deposit. There was a proposal uh, saying that we should uh, get back to 100% reserve banking, which will create more problems than uh, the solutions that we can think of. Uh, okay, let's run through this. So, so whatever uh, Douglas uh, uh, Diamond Digbit model came up with is the idea whenever you lend money and you lend it for two time periods, the chances that uh, you will get back that money after a uh, uh, one time period is two. And the chances that you will not get back that money is, uh, you'd get back, let's say $1 back or one rupee back is about half. So the pro when you calculate the expected value, expected value is the probability times the actual payoff. So half the times so you're get, getting a payoff of two and half the times so you're getting a payoff of one. So the expected value of a transaction of a bank lending is 1.5, which is fine. Now, half the times so you're still getting uh, nothing from your investment. You put one and you get one back, which is not useful for the bank. Now, how do we ensure that uh, there is some incentive for borrower to return that money? So they, they introduced a concept called foreclosure, which essentially means that if you default on your loan, uh, the bank has the capacity to take the asset back. Let's suppose they lend it out to uh, uh, a housing loan. They, you, the bank has the capacity to take that house back, which is a costly affair, but we have to calculate as to how much it will cost to foreclose that loan. Now, then he said, if you foreclose, then you bound the expected value at 1.5. It's not precisely 1.5. It's The upper bound is 1.5. Now, 
will that work all the time? Let's suppose the investors uh, want to take the money all at once. This is again the scenario that we were describing as to what is the role of the bank as an intermediary between firms and investors, uh, because banks monitor and uh, they have a dedicated monitoring system. They do this efficiently wherein they can monitor at the same time, make money from the loan that they give out. And for to do this, the bank has to be large and diversified, which is then the last line. Uh, as, like, let's suppose that uh, bank monitors and uh, diversifies across many borrowers, removing, removing all uncertainty, then it's exactly half the borrowers have to, I mean, these are the cases that I previously described. Uh, if you di diversify completely, uh, then you have to give out private information. I mean, I don't want to get into the details of this. If somebody has a doubt, I'll probably clear those out. Uh, bank still fails, even in even with let's say risk uh, risk free uh, assets, if everybody wants to take their money back. That's the key point. If uh, all the depositors, let's suppose there are hundred depositors and they have lent that money to the bank, if all of them want their money back, no matter how good the quality of the loans are bank will have issues. As a result, apart from foreclosure clause that they came up with, they came up with something called pooling and tranching. Pooling is how do you diversify? How do you essentially uh, uh, put the loans in a manner in which you distribute the loans in a manner in which not all the deposit uh, demand deposits come uh, calling at the same time. Tranching is uh, when you have give debt, there's something called senior debt and junior debt. Uh, and because there is seniority of debts uh, and the interest rates corresponding to these debt structures vary. As a result, you can have some sort of cushion. And uh, this was uh, done in the last 30, 40 years. Now, I think uh, I have the broad idea of diamond degree model is the fact that you can pull the bank, uh, the pool the deposits in a manner in which you can manage this asset liability uh, mismatch if the, it were to occur. The whole idea of the bank is to manage this mismatch. Okay. The, so uh, I, another in, important point that I must have previously uh, pointed out, there is a liquidity risk and then there's a solvency risk. Uh, solvency risk is assets are less than liabilities then uh, the company goes bankrupt immediately. Uh, then uh, there are uh, liquidity issues wherein assets are more than liabilities. It's just that you have to hold the assets for a long enough period of time so that the project is completed and you get your interest back. It might take three years, let's say. Now, if you uh, want that money back in the first year, then you won't get that money. As a result, uh, uh, this diamond digwick model essentially pulls it in a manner in which, and they give precise values as to the uh, in a manner in which uh, liquidity is created in the system. So, I mean, this is what was de being described. There are two, three time periods, time period at which you put one rupee and you get uh, one rupee back at date one, early liquidation, or you hold till maturity, you get two rupees back. Now, the issue is, and, and they have taken an example wherein, let's suppose there are 25, uh, Sam, uh, 25 depositors who want the money back uh in the first time period and there are 75 depositors who are willing to wait until the second time period to get their money back so 25 times uh 1.28 is about 32 uh and 32 people want to liquidate immediately and the rest 68 are, are willing to hold that is the ratio at which bank will be uh making money on these hundred deposits so that is what is getting calculated here. And this is all part of their uh, Digwig, uh, diamond Digwig model. Uh, I mean, it explains this in greater detail. And, uh, and even if uh, even if the rate is 70, even if 79 people come and take their deposits back, your bank would still fail, even if the quality of the loans are very high, because it, you, know, you, you cannot afford 79 people coming in, let's say period one, and taking their money back. That's the point that is getting made here. Okay, explain this. And uh, there are concepts like uh, equilibria uh, and comparative equilibria and Nash equilibria that I previously sort of explained. Uh, 
bank runs are not limited to banks. I mean, even uh, non-banking financial institutions also have bank run problems like Lehman Brothers, stable coins, or short-term securitization, money market funds. These are not traditional banks. The difference between traditional banks and all the other financial institutions are traditional banks have something called insurance deposit, which I think I must have pointed out in the uh, when I described the depression as part of the legislation that came about after the Great Depression in the 1930s, banks introduced uh, in, in deposit insurance, meaning like uh, the government is the lender of last resort and it guarantees that even if somebody defaults on, let's say, it, it defaults in the bank, it, it will ensure that your deposit is not harmed because the government has a implicit guarantee, which in, this implicit guarantee is the demand deposit. Uh, deposit insurance that was introduced after the Great Depression. Now, these institutions, these non-banking institutions don't have uh, deposit insurance as a result of which they get into a lot of risk. Uh, yeah, a very solvent, go solvent government can insure uh, depositors, which is the deposit insurance thing that I told you about, uh, which ensures that there is no panic in the market. All this, uh, the entire price uh, conveys the point that we are all trying to ensure that there is no panic in the market and people don't withdraw and create uh, bad equilibrium conditions, which uh, ensure that uh, there's more panic. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy, which ensures that more people pull out their money and they won't, and all the banks sort of go bankrupt at the same time. To prevent that, all this work was done. Even uh, Raghuram Rajan, who is the former uh, uh, RBI governor, contributed something in this regard. He has written papers with the Nobel laureate, wherein he proved that short-term debt is a stronger commitment to repay than long-term debt, especially for banks. This was his idea, which was cited in the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, at least committee. I mean, it was cited by the laureate himself because he is a long-term collaborator with Rajan. So I think another one of the another one of the prize winners is uh, Digbig, uh, Philip Digbig, and he has uh, contributed uh, on a bunch of things. Wherein I'll just uh, uh, quickly run through the last five six slides. Uh, basically, his idea is he uh, there are three people here. Ben Bernanke is an empiricist, meaning like he looks at data and tries to fit the model. Uh, the diamond uh, econ the economist by the name Diamond, he is a classical modeling person. He models, uh, he comes up with new models altogether. And the last one comes from the game theoretical point of view. Uh, the game theoretical point of uh, people who, economists with that bent of mind, usually usually study equally better. And he has read, done other papers. One of the interesting things that you can call, sort of relate with is the fact that uh, the fact that people are on social media, it, it, all your friends are on social media is the result of which you're on social media. This is essentially network effect. And they, these people didn't invent network effect or didn't uh, come up with the concept of net, network effect, but they at least uh, theorized it in some meaningful way because the fact that uh, bank, runs, bank runs happen is due to the concept called Nash equilibria that I previously described is very similar to network effect, wherein uh, you, you're withdrawing money because you think other people will withdraw money, which is analogous to the fact that you're on social media because other people are on social media. That is the point that I was trying to make. He has done uh, some of the work on uh, consumer information and product quality, which is digressing from the topic. I mean, he didn't get the award for this. And he has also figured out some interesting ways as to why unemployed people under certain conditions are costlier to be employed. And uh, I mean, there are a few other points that I can get into if there are any questions on this. Uh, I just And he has uh, come up with, uh, and uh, there are other people who are continuing to work on this field, uh, wherein uh, rationalizability is essentially trying to understand what everyone else's Nash equilibrium is. Meaning like what everybody else thinks of a certain transaction or a certain price 
right now based on which you have to decide on a certain price of a commodity. Uh, these are interesting concepts. Uh, the broadly, uh, uh, if I have to conclude, uh, the uh, underestimated, uh, the, the broad theme of the entire prize was the fact that if the financial markets work well and banking sector in the financial markets work well, this preempts any future uh, global uh, recession, right? Uh, for a, which is endured over a long period of time. That is the broad idea. And the tools that these people sort of came up with and found evidence for over a period of time sort of lays the groundwork. And the word uh, uh, prudential uh, norms are essentially looking at the entire system and not at each bank specifically. And, uh, you know, the other interesting idea is pooling deposits is one of the most socially useful roles of banking and aggregating everyone's deposit together and, and by making prop promises to the collective using the weight of probability. Weight of probability is like you hope the number of people will, uh, you know, withdraw money at any given point in time. And if you can compute that probability with and bound it at, with fair amount of certainty, then a bank can be profitable. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions you anybody has on this? Uh, happy to take. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful session and uh, giving us information about the Great Depression, uh, global financial crisis, uh, the roles of banks and uh, non-banking policies, and also giving us a bit information about the future perspective. And I don't see any questions in the chat box. Okay. So I think we don't have any questions for now. Cool. Yes, Thank, thanks for the... Uh, uh, can I ask one question, uh, Mr. Sure, Murthy? Sure. sure, sure. Uh, Seema, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, ma'am, you can ask. Okay. Uh, Mr. Murthy, uh, this is like, uh, I just want to know, like, when this kind of scam happens, like Vijay Malia, Neeraj Modi, these kind of scams, then yeah. who bears the final brunt of it? Because their assets are not going to uh, account for whatever the loans which have been given against uh, to the, to those people. So who finally bears the brunt of this thing? Yeah, so I just wanted to precisely point to the exact concept which talks about this. Uh, just hold on. Because I, I mean, there is... Yeah. This is uh, the, the fact that these people took public money and ran away. Let's suppose they took public money and they were not able to repay back. That concept is called moral hazard. Answering your question, government, if this is a publicly uh, listed company and if uh, government is the major stakeholder in the banks from which these people borrowed, then government has to repay that money. This is public money. So basically it's a taxpayer money which has gone to them. I won't call it taxpayer money. It's a depositor's money. Uh, eventually taxpayer, correct. Which is correct. Because, because government is funded yeah. by uh, taxpayers. So taxpayers, uh, they have taken uh, the moral hazard, which is essentially somebody uh, with insufficient incentive, or let's say uh, he did not have the intent to do the thing for which he took the loan and use that loan for something else. I mean, this is precisely it. I mean, this is public... Uh, public tax payment. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and there is one more question from the audience. Uh, how yeah. to escape from recession? Uh, how to escape from recession? Uh, usually, uh, the recessions happen whenever there is contraction in the economy. And the way to solve, uh, the way usually all central banks solve this problem is by decreasing interest rates and making sure that bank banks in banks plural start lending again when banks interest rates are low and enough businesses are borrowing money the recession sort of goes away usually in most scenarios so the so whenever in 2009 when the recession happened the interest rates went to zero uh, in us and interest rates went very low even in India, so that it incentivized uh, banks to lend to a lot of people. This is how uh, a recession is gotten rid of. 
you have to ensure that the banking system works properly. That's the way by which you can solve this problem. Is Indian economy out of danger of uh, economic recession? You're talking about uh, 2022. No, uh, 2022, they, uh, 2023, there will be a slowdown. Uh, I won't call it a recession. The official definition of recession is if you have two straight quarters of uh, 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 no growth, if you have two straight quarters of negative growth, then I think that is termed as a recession. I don't think you'll have a recession, but you'll have almost a scenario like recession in 2023, where the growth globally, including India, will be much smaller than the growth uh, that happened in 2022. So it'll be a mild recession. If I'm not in the prognosticating business, but if that's what you're asking, that's the answer. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you for the questions. Uh, now I would request Prashant, sir, to take over the session. Yeah, thank you, madam. Shall I continue? Yes, sir. Uh, Good evening, sir. Uh, it is my profound privilege to welcome you once again in uh, uh, the uh, DSU. So today we are having with us uh, Professor Ashwastha Ma Ramayya, sir. He has uh, authored a book a titled A Celebration Called Life, Householding Wife uh, Relationship, Success Through English uh, Alphabets, etc. He has produced a video film uh, entitled Parivartan with uh, film actors and professionals. He is engaged in a number of CSR activities like uh, coordinating training programs for uh, orphans, old age homes, NGOs, government officials, etc. So he has a unique uh, uh, consultation in a unique organization uh, engaged in a conducting exploratory training programs on the soft skills and quality relationship topic for the industrial. He's born in, uh, he born in 1995. Uh, unique uh, consultation has trained more than a 14, a uh, four lakhs people. Professor Ramaya <coughs> team has conducted effective training program in uh, many industries successful like engineering, pharmaceutical, IT, many more. So with this, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Professor Ramaya for his deliberation and welcome. Thank you for the opportunity and a very good evening to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to speak on a very relevant topic of how one can achieve peace or the significance of peace in one's life. Typically, the, the word peace is one of the most commonly used whether it is the professional life or in the personal life or the corporate jargons, especially after Corona, it has assumed tremendous amount of significance. I have always of the opinion that we talk of world peace or peace in the country, peace within the states. But I think the most fundamentally, the peace has to be attained in one's personality. Only peaceful people can make a country peaceful, the world peaceful. So I'll deliberate a little bit on how one can be peaceful within himself, which can then manifest as peace in relationships, peace between countries and peace in the whole world. The moment we utter the word peace, few associated thoughts will come to us. Basically, peace is a quiet, and a calm state of mind without any worries, without irritation, annoyance, or difficulties, manipulations, or other agendas. The peace is also associated with something which is direct, which is nascent, which is very good, pleasant, unadulterated, and not contaminated. 
So it is important for a person to develop and to inculcate peace in his mind if he really has to be peaceful with his relationships with his family members or colleagues in the uh, profession or in business or with neighbors, etc. Which also means that the peace is also a stress-free state which gives a feeling of security. In fact, this feeling of security is one of the biggest advantages of peace. Peaceful people, it's a pleasure to watch peaceful people. They are calm, quiet, not that they are lethargic or lazy, no. There is a choiceless awareness. There is a beauty in the way they talk, they walk, they carry on their day-to-day -day activities. So I would say everyone should have peace as one of the major goals to be achieved in his mind. In fact, one of the major uh, lines which I keep talking in my training programs are clarity in mind and purity in heart is the surety for success. If a person has very clear thoughts and is very pure in his emotions, success is a foregone conclusion. Now, how can one be peaceful within himself? It's a very important question. It is easy to talk about the peace between families, between countries or between states. But how can one be peaceful within himself? For that, we need to really understand what are the various components of our personality. Like our country is made up of number of states or a corporate is made up of number of departments like production or service or HR or finance. Our personality is also is a combination of various elements. Predominantly, there are four elements in our personality. One is body, second is mind, third is intellect, and fourth is emotions. Of course, for the time being, I'm keeping away the soul or spirit or consciousness or even conscience separately. Some things that is very easily perceivable, people are these four. Body, mind, intellect, and emotions. Body is basically an assemblage of the organs, anatomy and physiology. Mind is the other name of thoughts. Intellect is the decision-making faculty of the mind. And emotions are your feelings. So if one has to be peaceful within himself, it only means all these four elements have to work in harmony, have to get aligned. I'll give a simple example. Right now, all of you are staying wherever you are physically, but some of our mind thoughts may be on something else other than my talk. Some people may be intellectually deciding how to reply a email which has come today. Some people may be having their emotions and recalling their pleasant moments with their daughter, son, or spouse, etc. So if this is the way a personality exists, where body is here, mind is thinking something else, intellect is deciding something else, and emotions or somewhere else are with somebody else, then the person is not centered. He is not holistic. He is not balanced. He is not anchored. He is not grounded. And that is the genesis of not being peaceful. Peace means your body, your mind, your intellect, and your emotions. That means your organs, your thoughts, your decision-making capability, and your feelings are all aligned with the same thing, with the same person, in the same place. Such a person is said to be peaceful. Now, some people ask me, sir, is it important to be peaceful or is it important to be joyful? It's a very interesting question. I always say, if peace is like foundation, joy is like the superstructure. In fact, accepting people who get joy by wrong type of feelings, joy is an extension of peace. Why a person can be happy, can be joyful only if by nature, fundamentally, he is peaceful. So peace is more elementary over which is like a foundation over which the superstructure of joy or happiness has been built. And therefore, to be joyful, we need to pass through the door of peace. Now, when this peace within ourselves manifests itself as peace with others, we will develop very good interpersonal relations, friendliness, 
harmony with people empathy that is the ability with which we can look things from others frame of reference the helping attitude or the service attitude inclusiveness wherein we feel that we we as human beings are not a special species but we include within us the animals the vegetables the plants so in other words if a person is peaceful within himself he will be able to establish peace with others in his relationships in his profession with his colleagues peers etc and that is how the world peace becomes a reality now how do we develop this peace one of the simple logic is peace is inversely proportional to the number of thoughts more number of thoughts we have less peaceful we are so very simple logic less number of thoughts we have more peaceful we are for example let us say you are very anxious to get a result of your interview or your son's examination whatever you will find in those anxious moments the number of thoughts are too high but the moment you come uh, come to know of the result especially if it's a positive one or even negative one you will find that the number of thoughts will subside the moment the number of thoughts subside the peace increases and when peace increases happiness becomes a reality so we should endeavor to reduce the number of thoughts but how do we reduce the number of thoughts because thoughts appear to be not in our control they just keep coming and going and we appear to have no control there is a parade of thoughts good thoughts bad thoughts wrong thoughts holy thoughts unholy thoughts whatever one of the technique adopted is The, our number of thoughts have got a bearing have got a connection with the number of breathings we do per minute if we can breathe slow the number of thoughts will reduce if we breathe fast the number of thoughts will increase it is a very common experience you will find that when you are anxious angry or scared your breathing also will be high and your number of thoughts also thoughts also will be more if we learn to breathe slow which is propounded in lot of slow breathing or pranayama techniques etc in yoga you will find the number of thoughts will become less and when the number of thoughts become less we can attain peace in our mind basically our thoughts have got three characteristics if you really unbiasedly analyze critically your thoughts you will find thoughts have got three characteristics one is the quantity of thoughts is too high which the brain cannot handle and that is why no thought many many of the thoughts cannot be drawn to their logical conclusion so let us say i am i am just thinking of my vehicle and it is not working i should think about what is wrong and should i take to a garage yesterday what should be done so i will go to garage by 10 o'clock so the thought has been drawn to a logical conclusion and it needs time for this unfortunately even before thought number 1 is drawn to its logical conclusion there is a thought number 2 striking there is a thought number 3 striking so the number of thoughts is simply unmanageable sometimes which leads to overthinking haunting thoughts disturbing thoughts repetition of thoughts so the first problem of peace is to have of not having peace is to have more number of thoughts the second is the direction of thoughts as i told it is not unidirectional thought number 1 is on uh, the family thought number 2 is on profession thought number 3 on health thought number 4 so it's all jumbled up and number 3 is the quality of thoughts many times people may have quality of thoughts being very negative like anger jealousy worry depression fear ego inferiority complex so if we need to be peaceful and have a control or liberate our thoughts one the number of thoughts has to be reduced two the thoughts need to be aligned three the quality of thoughts needs to improve if one can have this as an agenda and do some mental exercises you will find that the all these three things will be taken care of the quantity the number the quantity the direction and the quality of thoughts and to that extent the mind becomes peaceful it is also necessary to have a good lifestyle in fact positive lifestyle will lead to 
lot of peace in the mind. And this lifestyle should take care of all the aspects of personality. Like for example, to maintain the physical health, we need to have balanced food, nutritious food, do some physical exercises, have a correct posture in sitting, standing, sleeping, keep your face smiling, take sufficient rest and relaxation, be under the sun so that you get absorption of some vitamin D. All these aspects will develop your physical aspect of your personality. The mental aspect can be developed by developing a positive attitude and developing the reducing the number of thoughts, developing creativity, thinking out of the box. All these aspects and having a control on the thoughts, reduce the number of thoughts, doing meditation, having a mental holiday once in a while, giving a gap between the thoughts. All these things will ensure that your mind will become tranquil. Now, intellectually to improve, we need to make right decisions in right time, which means we should know the problem solving techniques. And when we decide we should not be biased, we should not suffer from preconceived notions. And finally, emotionally, we need to lead a very good life by good lifestyles like developing a helping attitude to others, service attitude, developing gratitude to people who are well plus developing prayer, for example, spending time with uh, the family members, uh, developing the national spirit of patriotism, developing a sense of appreciation for good things. All these things will develop. So if we can nurture these four aspects of our personality by the menu what I have given, physical, mental, intellectual, emotional, the ultimate effort, ultimate result of this will be that Body will be immune, mind will be peaceful, intellect will be sharp, and emotions will be stable. And that is the ideal ground for establishing and developing peace. Emotions can also be very nicely developed by listening to melodious music, looking at nature, developing surrenderance to God. These are all the ways by which the emotional intelligence can be developed and the emotional quotient can be increased. And when it comes to peaceful, I always say, we need to find our mind. We need to mind our mind. We need to mend our mind. We need to send and tend our mind. We need to bend our mind. We need to bind our mind and we need to end our mind. I'll just explain very briefly. First of all, we need to find our mind. Many people think uh, they don't think of the mind at all. They are so much bothered about the body and the materialistic things that they don't think that they have a mind at all. The first thing is that we need to locate our mind. We need to talk to our own mind. We need to be very comfortable with our mind. Very nicely it is told that mind is the worst possible master and the best possible servant. Mind your mind. Now, second thing is mind your mind. Having located, we need to know the importance of the mind. Basically, today, many doctors are telling many of the diseases which come are predominantly rooted in the mind, which are called psychosomatic, where the mind influences the body, which is the opposite of somopsychic, where the body influences the mind. So we need to know the importance of mind. Then we need to mend our mind. The negative thoughts need to be not attended, not labeled. They need to be replaced with positive thoughts. We also need to send and tend our mind to such lectures or books, reading the books, etc., so that our knowledge base will increase. The mind has a lot of stuff to operate under any situations. We also need to bend our mind, which means we need to be flexible, we need to be adaptable. We need to be not having the rigid mentality, not strong do's and don'ts or rights and wrongs in life. We need to be flexible, adaptable, develop lateral thinking, out of the box thinking. And we need to lend our mind, lend our mind to the suffering people, help them out, the underprivileged. We need to bind our mind with the good values. And we also need to end our mind, that is the thoughts with meditation where we bring our mind to a zero level. 
So if a person and his individual capacity can develop this harmony between the various aspects of your personality, obviously you will find there will be a better interpersonal relations, better harmony within the states, resulting in an excellent, a monolithic country and a very holistic style of working, wherein in the whole world, everyone appreciates other cultures. There is no animosity and there is no hatred towards people. There is a sense of belongingness. There is a sense of inclusiveness. In other words, the, the formula for developing the world peace is to have an individual peace within oneself by developing physical immunity, mental tranquility, memory longevity, concentration intensity, increased creativity, intellectual clarity, emotional stability, social empathy, domestic unity, relaxed prosperity, and above all spiritual identity. Now that is the recipe for developing peace within himself, peace within people, peace within the countries, culminating in the world peace. Now I'll just put some slides to sum up whatever I've talked, whatever I've spoken. Then I leave the floor open for some questions if it. Let me just put some of the slides. They become a sort of summary. A quiet peace is basically a quiet and a calm state of mind. It is harmony and friendship among people, where there is no disturbance in the mind like still water, and freedom from worry, irritation, annoyance, hostility, war, and conflict. And it is a stress-free state, secured feeling of coexistence. Typically, we give the example of if we have a bowl of water and the water is disturbed and turbulent, you cannot see our face properly. So an agitated mind cannot see the true reality. The water needs to be still if you have to see the reality in its splendor and grandeur and in its nascent state. That's why typically I always say we should work in such a way that outside that we are extremely active, but inwardly we are very calm. Like you see, outside there are so many waves, noise, lather, etc. But a few feet or kilometer below, there is a total tranquility. I say tremendous activity outside and total tranquility inside is the passport for prosperity every side. Now that is the genesis of, that is the definition of this. Let me go to the next one. As I told, if the individuals are not peaceful within themselves, world peace becomes only a daydream. It is futile to talk of world peace without having peace within the minds, within the families, within the, amongst the people. Next. How can we achieve peace within, a, within one person? Predominantly by establishing a harmony between the body, mind, intellect, emotions, and intrapersonal communication, what we communicate within ourselves, not interpersonal where we communicate with others. After all, your interpersonal relations where you communicate with others, is a logical extension and a manifestation of what you communicate within yourself. Now, when you are peace within yourself, with others it will manifest as friendliness, harmony, mutual understanding, trust, inclusiveness, teamwork, and good interpersonal relations. And coming to the next point of how to develop peace, which I told you, I have given you some tips of how we can develop peace. You can go to the next one. Reduce the number of thoughts by slow breathing, rest, relaxation, positive emotions. Bring every thought to a logical conclusion. Develop positive, optimistic, realistic, pragmatic and noble thoughts which produce feel-good chemicals in the body. See, our body is a huge chemical factory. One good thought produces a lot of feel-good chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, or epinephrine, or GABA, oxytocin, acetylcholine, including melatonin. A bad thought will also develop a lot of toxins like cortisols, catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline. So it's a huge chemical factor. 
So it's very important for us to develop positive thinking so that feel good chemical get produced, which ensures our physical, mental and emotional health. Avoid negative thoughts of pessimism, mistrust, manipulation, hidden agenda, toxic thoughts. Speak with your minds, touch your organs with your mind, express gratitude to your organs. They are working for us day in and day out, mind is working and we don't even recognize their existence. Avoid overthinking and crowding of the thoughts. And how can we develop a positive lifestyle, which is a prerequisite for peace in the mind by taking sattvic food, slow breathing, meditation, passive observation of thoughts leading to mental holiday, watching nature, melodious music, rest and relaxation, prayer, service to others, including if possible, embracing spirituality. Next. Now coming to the point which I told you, what is a holistic life in which peace is one of the activity, if one of the aspect you can put the whole thing. Physical immunity, mental tranquility, memory longevity, concentration intensity, increased creativity, intellectual clarity, emotional stability, social empathy, domestic unity and relaxed prosperity and finally spiritual identity. That is the formula for leading a very holistic type of life in which peace becomes a foregone conclusion. Next. And when we come to our mind, which is a storehouse of peace, find your mind, become aware of the function of the mind, mind your mind, give importance to your mind, mend your mind by correcting your negative thoughts, send and tend your mind to various people, listening, reading books, etc. Bend your mind by keeping the mind flexible and adaptable. Lend your mind to serve the suffering people. Bind your mind with good values of life like gratitude, empathy, love, concern. And end your mind, ending the thoughts by meditation. That is the formula for establishing peace in the mind. And this manifests as world peace. What happens if each one becomes peaceful within himself? This, this is how the world will look. Next. You will find that there will be a win-win relations between the countries. The trading between the countries will be for mutual benefit. There will be no territory aggression that some country wants to snatch the things from the other countries. Each country respects the culture, tradition, industry, core competencies of people of other countries. There will be a cultural exchange and knowledge sharing. Lot of peace summits, conference, etc., to enhance the peace among countries may be organized. Economic and social equality, very important. There is no point in a country where rich keep becoming richer and poor becoming poor. This gap has to be reduced to establish peace. Identify and act against the persons who create problems to disrupt the peace. Synergy, trust, respect, networking, collaboration, consensus between the countries, amongst the countries. That is how the world will look. If the microcosm within us has been rectified, the macro macrocosm will become a reality. So with this, I would like to close and open if there are any. I also want one help from the people. We'll just administer a small uh, Google form. I invariably collected in all my programs. My colleague Meghana will administer it. Take only about half a minute to fill it up. Please send it in the chat box so that we can know your honest opinion about the program. We can, can administer this, the Google form, please fill it up. And then we can have one or two questions before I wind up because I would not like to extend the time given to you. Oh, so the Google has a form has been written. What happened? The Google form yeah. is in the chat box. Right? Yeah, the Google form is in the chat box. Kindly fill up the uh, Google form. It's very, very important for us. Your feedback yeah, is very valuable for us. And it will take hardly any time. We have made it a very simple format.
Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, those who are finished, uh, you one or two questions, if time permits, I can take up. But whatever little I know, I will try to talk it out. There are few questions. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so it is, so if we think the future, the mm. peace will go and anxiety increases. Mm. So to be peaceful, should we stop thinking about future? How can we overcome this? Now, thinking about future does not create anxiety in my opinion. Worrying about the future creates the anxiety. In fact, thinking and planning for the future makes your mind more peaceful. That is something like being proactive rather than being reactive. But the problem comes up when you become anxious of future and anxiety is not based on reality. See, I'll give you an example. Let us say after this program, I'm going outside. I can definitely think if I have to have a dinner, which hotel I should go. Futuristically, I should definitely think. Now, this will not create any anxiety or lack of peace. But if I start worrying, I'll take my vehicle and when you go, suppose I accident happens, suppose I die, suppose something happens. No, this is not based on reality. Thinking about future is very much needed so long as it is a contingency plan. It is a plan B. It is for future and it is very much needed. But the problem is when you think things which are not based on reality, the anxieties and fears which are manufactured by your mind, that is where the problem lies. I hope I'm making it clear, madam. So thinking about future is a must, but worrying about future, getting anxious about future is something we should avoid. And that makes our mind not to be at peace. Good. Any, uh, madam, uh, whoever asked this question, uh, am I clear or any questions on this? Uh, any doubts? Now, uh, it was from the chat box that someone has asked this question. Yeah, yeah, please, please tell me the questions. How to reduce academics uh, related stress and attain peace in life? After? How to reduce? Academic-related uh -huh. stress and attain peace in life. One by increasing your faculties. Like suppose you increase your concentration. So if you have to read, read about 10 pages in your, tech, in your book or a project report, if your concentration is better, if your mind is very structured, you may take only about 10 minutes. But if the mind is very muddled and too many irrelevant thoughts come, to read the same academic 10 pages, you take about 25 minutes. So by developing clarity in the mind and also keeping away the irrelevant thoughts by enhancing your concentration and memory power, you will find the time taken for the academic work will get much reduced. And to that extent, time gets liberated, which you can use it for developing other aspects of your personality. And that can be, and mind can be nurtured and developed concentration improvement or memory improvement or creativity by a lot of mental practices like slow breathing, pranayam, meditation, the alpha level of methods of mind control. These are the techniques available to us by which our time spent on academic things can get reduced. Still maintaining the effectivity of our academic work. Good. Any other questions? Feel free to ask. Yes, sir. There is one more. Yeah. Have to maintain world peace when there are when there are unavoidable territorial aggression by countries like Russia and China. I mean, it, it is like this. Very rightly, it is told. I cannot change the whole world, but I can change the world around me. There is no point in thinking that the whole world needs to be carpeted. But I can wear a sandal or a ch chapel. There is no point in blaming the rain which is coming, but I can hold an umbrella. So if each one can think of how we can establish peace and handle, starting from within his mind, with his family, with his colleagues, with his peers, with his community, you will find the world peace becomes a reality. Otherwise, 
when we get bothered about those things which are not in our control we will not be able to handle even those things which are in our control so that is how i i i would only say that let us bother about those things which are in our control and make the life more worthy of living and this world a better place you will find if most of the people are critical mass of the public things like this there won't be any aggressions in my opinion i hope i'm clear sir sure any other questions sir ashwan sir yes, thank sir. you very much sir thank you very much uh, i you know i really appreciate the constant support you extend to Thank our you. institute and uh, i think um, we need to work towards as you said inner peace which Absolutely. will lead to the peace inside the home and then peace inside the city and then it leads to the Correct. peace towards yeah. the nation uh, i'm really thankful sir i, 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 yeah, think I only you, want uh, if some of you want to speak about how did you find about the program very quickly you can talk it over apart from what you are written in the format so that i can we can get an idea of your opinion or impressions on the program before we formally close yeah yeah i think uh, uh, dr sonal can you can speak on that please yes i mean any any person who is listening can tell a few words in a very brief yeah um, yes sir. good evening sir uh, yeah. very nice to hear your talk uh yeah it was very uh, like refreshing to see like how uh, peace can be achieved by your mental physical emotional and intellectual uh, uh, growth and peace within you can be developed in these ways so we we did not relate it with so many factors peace we just generally think like the world peace or something like that so this was a new perspective we have gained on the peace and which was uh, a refreshing thing to know for all of us so it's a nice talk from nice, you nice to know thank that thank you so much anyone would, anyone else would like to tell a few words quickly about the program Uh, good evening, sir. This is Dr. Prashant Tiwari. Yes. I wanted to know how to connect the soul, uh, soul, brain, and body. If there is a contradiction mm. between heart and mind, mm. and can this uh, peace between brain and uh, soul may reach us towards a uh, divinity, a Lord, or any uh, any uh, to whomsoever we believe. Uh, see, uh, it is it it may be not be very proper to bring the soul or spirit element, because soul or spirit is something which encompasses all these things. So honestly speaking, your body, mind, intellect, emotions, your perceptions, your all these things are housed in your soul. It is based on your soul. Your soul is the supporting mechanism for all these things. so there is no in my opinion need to align the soul with the body it is something like you know we can align karnataka with tamil nadu we can align karnataka with maharashtra but i don't think we can align karnataka with india you know the india contains all the things so soul is like that soul is the basic substratum the foundation the quintessence the road on which all the vehicles of life move whether it is your body mind etc so soul and spirit we should keep it aside it is, is encompassing everything but definitely we need to align our body with the mind with the intellect and the emotions with our perceptions with our values and that comes based on the menu which i gave you starting from food physical exercises taking rest being under sun uh, having uh, relaxation having good sleep at the physical level and developing uh, uh, quality of thoughts developing gratitude listening to melodious music respecting elders surrenders to god helping the underprivileged people for example being with pets considering the nature as our own extension having a inclusiveness all these things will align our body mind intellect and emotions and make our personality very holistic and monolithic and that is the starting point of the inward peace which will manifest as peace outside where soul and spirit has to be kept a little aside because that is all in capacity i hope i i made some point 
Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. sir. There is one more question, I think, from yes. one of the participants. If you please. permit, we will, I'll read please, it out. Please, please, most welcome. So, Tanushree is asking that being peaceful and neutral is often mistaken as being a diplomat or a weak or irresponsible person. Mm -hmm. How to deal with that kind of situations? No, it is basically, it is something like a person who is sleeping and a person who is meditating for an, on, for an onlooker will look the same. But whereas a person who is sleeping has no mental activity, whereas a person who is meditating is at the highest mental activity. Peacefully. So, it may not be necessary that we need to be bothered of what others, what the onlookers will think. What is the precise question so that I can answer accurately? Yeah, I'll read it out again. Yeah, please, please. One second. Being peaceful and neutral is often mistaken as being diplomat or weak. Yeah. So, how to deal with that? Yes, yes, yes. See, so we are not really concerned how others will feel and will they mistake our peace as our weakness? I think that is the precise question. So being peaceful doesn't, if, if you think that if I am peaceful, I look very inert, I look very lackluster, I look like a very dull person. We are not concerned about it. We are concerned about what happens within us. So if somebody else feels that I am dull, how can I come out of it? In my interactions with him, suppose I smile at him, I will empathize with him, I will show courtesy to him, my interpersonal relations with him is better, not inert, not passive. Then people will think this person is not a lethargic or a weak-minded person, he is an extremely evolved person in the mind. No, some people have got into the habit that you just to show off your presence, you need to be highly extrovert. Talk, make noise and more limbs, more expressions, more body language. No, no, it is not necessary. Making too much of noise is not a manifestation of your energy. What is needed is the qualitative interactions with people. So the other persons will notice that you are peaceful, how it is not that you are peaceful, you are having a lot of knowledge. Your wisdom is very high. Your mental sharpness is very good. You respect others' opinion. So when people notice this, they will definitely think that this person is a peaceful person, not a weak or a meek or a timid person. Whereas by being peaceful, you don't talk to people. You always have a sad face. You don't reply to people, you appear disconnected, you develop a pseudo renunciation as though you are living in a world of your own. Then people will think, oh, what is the use of this type of peace? Wherein he cannot communicate, he cannot relate to people. So we need to develop the peace of the first kind, wherein we are active, we are very dynamic, but very, very, very balanced, being firm yet very polite. So then people will not mistake that you are a dull or a diplomatic or a person who doesn't want to participate in the world outside. That should be the equation. You will find that most of the people who are highly knowledgeable and who are contributing very heavily to the whole world, they all appear to be a little silent people. Those people who talk too much, very what I should say, extroverts and very hyperactive. We don't know whether their thoughts are very matured. I typically give an example. If you take a can and you put 10 paisa coins and you just do like this, it makes so much of noise. But you put 2000 rupees note about 100 and you do like this, it makes no noise. But which is more valuable? The one which made noise or the one which is replete with a lot of knowledge and wisdom and values. So just because this second box is not making noise, you cannot think that it is it is uh, no, ignorant, not knowledgeable, it is lackluster, it is dull. No, not this. You will also find most of the great people are very humble in na by nature. They respect others. 
it is only the half developed brains which try to show off so we should not get into the trap of mistaking the violently being outside as something to create an impact or make our presence felt and that is the way i look at it even today's lecture you saw i mean there was a very what is euphoric and making lot of things no, no, no not not needed if if my talk is having knowledge if my talk is resourceful you will definitely appreciate that no need for me to talk at a very high language and use it bombastic language no need very nicely it is told it is simple to be good it is good to be simple but but it is very difficult to be simple so all knowledgeable people in my opinion are very simple whether in their dress or food habits or talk or relations it is only the people who are insecure in their feeling who talk more who make uh, too much of expressions who want to be in the news always and who want to be in the limelight these are all mental weaknesses in my opinion i don't know whether i made some uh, point sure okay any other question before we close very there nice are, that many of you are asking questions that's nice there are many questions sir ha ah, quickly the time is running out one second i think i can receive main, uh, uh, yeah. to get rid of overthinking i try to make myself busy with my work and i feel peace sometimes and because of that i get exhausted but when i try to relax or take some time for rest i get more anxious what should we do to overcome this no it happens initially uh, some people say when i sit for meditation i become more tense it happens to some people because that appears to be unnatural state for us you know a overthinking and thinking too many thoughts would have become our habit any any abnormality where it is practiced for a very long time it looks like a normality i give an example a person was going in a cycle and he fell down so some people who are passing there wanted to help him so they want to lift him so they asked this person who was fallen down from the cycle says <laughs> why have you come no those people told her man you fell down no we want to help you and this person was fallen down from the cycle says who says i have fallen down this is my normal way of getting down from cycle so for some people being abnormal would have become normal so don't worry if you are overthinking you just convert that thinking don't reduce the number of thoughts if that is difficult reduce convert the quality of thoughts into something which is more positive and follow the lifestyle which i told like slow breathing for example making your exhalation of air longer than inhalation for example uh, inhale for 5 seconds 1 2 3 4 5 you exhale for 10 seconds 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 practice this 1 to 2 1 is to 2 so you will find your breathing becomes less right now you may be breathing at 20 times per minute if it can be made to 10 12 times to that extent the overthinking becomes less because mind is not in our control but mind is controlled by breathing through manipulating the breathing we can have a control on the mind so that is how we need to bring to rest bring reduce the hyper functioning of the mind by developing some lifestyle like listening to melodious music walking in nature for example playing with children the way they want to play now these are all the activities which make your brain to get down from beta waves to alpha waves alpha waves about 10 hertz the moment you reduce the functioning the frequency of the brain waves you will find your number of thoughts will reduce once the number of thoughts reduces you can give a direction to the thoughts you can also enhance the quality of thoughts that is the way it needs to be done good any other in fact i have got i have made a chart which i given my training programs 30 activities where i i have given a what is it say a list like if you do many of those activities every day as a checklist 
you will find you will develop lot of mental tranquility and a hold on your mind see basically mind should listen to what you say not you should listen to what mind says it all depends on who is controller and who is controlled so you should be the controller and mind mind should be the control to not the other way around so that helps quite good any other uh, thank you so much sir for sure. such a wonderful and informative session now i would like to hand over this virtual podium to dr shonal dubey for further proceeding thank you once again sure thank you dr prashant uh, thank you so much sir we had a very nice and uh, informative talk from you so i am here to uh, give a vote of thanks but before vote of thanks i would like to have some feedback for our overall uh, this event of the nobel lecture series which we had carried out for, for past 3 weeks this is today is the third week of it so i would like to have some feedback from the participants so we have two or three participants with us who would like to share their uh, journey through this lecture series i would like to invite ms janani uh, to give her feedback first over to you janani am i audible ma'am yeah you are audible yeah. yeah good evening everyone this is janani from b farm 7 sim and uh, the uh, series of uh, all the sessions were very informative about the topics that uh, who had uh, the topics that had won the nobel prizes in this year that is 2022 in various fields and this is uh, since three weeks uh, the first week uh, december 2nd the first speaker dr neeraj reddy madella spoke about dr pabo genesis who won nobel prize in the year 2022 for sequencing genome of neanderthal and in this session we understood about the history of dna technological advancements and uh, evolution of human and genomics and the second session of uh, the day one professor p c deshmukh uh, talked about entanglement reality and quantum computation and we also understood about the basics of computing cause and effect of determinism and about the bell's theory quantum theory and teleportation techniques and the second session that which was held on december 9th the very first speaker of the session professor hans will hof talked about carolyn r betzy morton meldel k barry sharpless who won nobel prize in the chemistry 2022 for click reactions here we understood about the concept of click reactions and copper free click reactions for biological and biomedical chemistry and the second session of day 2 Ms. Shaumona Simha talked about Annie Ernax who won the nobel prize in the year 2022 in literature we understood the modest lifestyle of ernie ernax and her ben believes and about her novel emphasis we came to note that literature is universal approach and there is no need to find solutions for it and as today the day 3 uh, the speak first speaker mr akash murthy sir talked about ben bernan k who won the nobel prize in 2022 for banking and information asymmetry which means that borrower knows more information than seller and we also got to know about the key function of a bank and simple economics of lending that is adverse selection moral hazard and bank also borrows some money from ultimate savers and also about the great depression and finally my favorite personally my favorite session that is second uh, speaker uh, professor v ashwatha ramaiya sir talked about the importance of peace in life and all those experience that which he shared were very practical and quite acceptable by all of us and i really like the statement that which we told that is clarity in mind and purity in heart is surety for success which was really acceptable and uh, joy is an extension of peace which is again very reliable and very refreshing and he also i like the way he he gave a mathematical expression that is peace is inversely proportional to number of thoughts and number of thoughts is again directly proportional to number of breathings so and he also talked about the positive lifestyle which leads to good peace and world peace could be achieved only by individual peace finally i would like to conclude by saying that these sessions were really motivating on innovative approaches that to especially to us youngsters they are just really igniting our minds about various innovations and how to convert them into useful products thank you thank you janni for summarizing up our full noble week lecture series so nicely 
Uh, next up, we have our feedback from uh, Vijit. Vijit, will you take it up? Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. And one and all present here. Uh, I'm Vijay Nagesh Bhatt, studying in final year BPAM. It's my pleasure to be here to give feedback on this uh, session. It was really a wonderful series of informat informative sessions by Dr. Neeraja Reddy, ma'am, Professor P.C. Deshmukh, sir, Professor Hans Zilhaup, sir, Dr. Sh uh, Shimona Sinha, uh, Mr. Akshmurti, sir, Professor V. Ashwat Ramaya, sir. Uh, knowledge is like an ocean in that we have grabbed information as much as possible to us. From this session, we got to know regarding the recent discoveries in different fields like medicine, physics, chemistry, literature, economics, and peace. Lecture series is highlighted discoveries of Nobel Prize topics, its importance, and greatest benefits to humankind leading to a sustainable development. We would like to have such a great informative international talks and seminars in upcoming days. The program was finally coordinated and arranged and given platform for all the peoples uh, from scientific as well as non-scientific communities. I would like to thank the College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Dayanand Sagar University, and our beloved principal, Dr. N.M. Raghavendra sir, and panel team for a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, Vijit. Uh, next up, I would like one of our senior faculty member, Dr. Kalpana, to give her inputs on her thoughts on how uh, the lecture series being conducted. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sony. The COPS DSU had organized the Nobel Prize lecture series for past three Fridays. On the 9th of December, there were very informative sessions about research on extinct hominid genomes by Dr. Neeraja. And in the area of physics, it was about entangled photon experiments by Dr. P.C. Deshmukh. He also gave a very good explanation about quantum information sciences. On 16th, there were two interesting sessions. The first one by Dr. Hans, which was on click chemistry. He gave a detailed session about oxidation of speed up relationship modulation of polymer chemistry, which was followed by a session by Ms. Shimona for literature, where she was very expressive about her thought process. Today's sessions were excellent in which Mr. Akash Murthy gave a scenario about stress or recession in financial market and its consequences. The last session by Professor V. Ashwat Ramaya, uh, where he elaborated on peace in personality uh, or internal peace. And he very rightly said that joy is an extension of peace. Overall, the sessions were made very interesting by the speakers and gave an insight about the areas which are quite unfamiliar to us who are pharmacists by profession. I thank all the organizers for this series and look forward for many more in future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalpana. So with this few feedbacks, we have come to the end of our Nobel uh, Prize lecture series. So before we end, I would like to propose a formal vote of thanks so as we have reached the culmination of our three week long event of the Nobel Prize lecture series, it is my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on the behalf of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Dayanam Sagar University, Bangalore for this event. First and foremost, I would like to extend our heartfelt th thanks and appreciation to all the speakers who provided the insight in their respective fields and enlightened us with their knowledge. I would like to reiterate their names here. Dr. Neerja Reddy Maleda, who is a genetic counselor at Map My Genomes, Professor P.C. Deshmukh, a theoretical atomic physicist, Professor Hans Zulhoff, who is the chair of organic chemistry at Wageningen University, Ms. Shimona Sinha, who is a naturalized French writer, Mr. Akash Murthy, co founder and CTO of U Primes, and Professor Ashwit Ramaya founder and leading trainer and management consultant. So these were the backbones on which we have run our three weeks of the Nobel Prize lecture series. Thank you all the speakers for joining us. Uh, after our speakers, I would like to express our sincere thanks to all the participants from all over the India and our own students for their enthusiastic participation. We hope that this Nobel Prize lecture series has given you a better insight into 
the various uh, science fields and the other fields which have gained prominence this year. Nurturing the young mind was the major focus behind the conduct of this series. And I hope we were able to achieve this to a certain level. Now I would like to take this opportunity to thank the management of the Anand Sagar University, which includes Dr. D. Hem Chandra Sagar, Chancellor, Dr. D. Prem Chandra Sagar, Pro-Chancellor, Dr. K. N. B. Murthy, Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Puttamadappa, Registrar of the Anand Sagar University. Thank you for the support. I would like to extend our gratefulness to Dr. Pushpa Sarkar, Dean School of Allied Health Sciences for her constant support. Thanks are due to our principal, Dr. N.M. Raghavendra, who is the brain behind this lecture series, starting from conceptualization to the overall arrangement of this event. A big word of appreciation to our core team for their constant effort and hard work to carry out this event flawlessly. I would like to mention the names here, the team comprising of Dr. Prashant Tiwari, Dr. Gyanarupa Priya, Dr. Nandini, Ms. Seema Rathor, Dr. Mahadeva Ma, and myself. Thank you. Uh, thanks to our social media coordinator, Mr. Shaukat Ali, and our IT support, Mr. Rintiyas, for the smooth conduct of the event. Thanks are due to our teaching faculty and non-teaching staff and our students for their support in making this event a success. Thank you, everybody present here. Thanks for joining in. So I'm, uh, we are signing off uh, for the evening and for the event. Thank you very much for helping us making this event a success. Good night, everybody, and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you all for this successful event. Good night for all of you. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, ma'am. Good night, sir. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Thank you, everyone.